So this is the first sentence of Gass's essay on translation, titled Trans Reading. Perhaps Gass's most specific and concrete theorization of translation. As I mentioned, the rest of this paper is essentially a close reading of this essay, uh, and really of this sentence. I think this is the first time that I've written a piece that is reading one sentence. Uh, uh, but as you will see, this kind of minimal close reading and attention to detail is extremely fitting of Gass's work as a writer, as a literary critic, and of his particular take on translation. Gass's terms reading is included in his reading real kit, Reflections on the Problems of Translation, originally published in 1999, uh, 17 years ago now. In my opinion, Gass, Gass's extremely relevant exploration of translation in his work has not received the critical attention that it deserves within the growing and expanding field of translation studies in general, and the subfield of literary tr translation in particular. One exception, and this is a very recent exception, is the critic Elizabeth Lowe, who stresses the relevance of Gass's approach to translation in the recent Companion to Translation Studies, edited by Sandra Berman and Catherine Porter in 2014. Here's Lowe's take on Gass's theory and poetics of translation. Quote, in his masterful work, Rian Rilke, Gass does a line-by-line -line comparison of 16 translations, including his own, of Rilke's Duino elegies. As he analyzes the poems and translations in the context of Rilke's life and time, Gass lays out a poetics of translation and retranslation. A foundational premise is that translation, translation is reading, reading of the best, most essential kind, quoting here, she's quoting uh, Gass. Translation, indeed, is, quote, trans-reading one language and one particular user of the language reads another. Uh, successful trans-reading is to ask the right questions of the text. And I just wanted to clarify that uh, in uh, Lowe's uh, quotation, she's merging two different lines from the same essay in the same sentence. So that's why it kind of sounds weird. Um, as suggested by Lowe here, Gass's conceptualization of translation as reading and of reading as translation entails a particular analysis and experience of reading as a mediation between specific users of language. The kind of mediation that can be conceptualized in terms of what is generally understood as translation, as an interlingual process. Within Gass's formulation of trans-reading, therefore, translation appears as a realm of mediation inherently connected to the act of reading across languages let's say from German to English, for example, and using the examples included in Gass's essay from Holderlin's poem, uh, Half to this Levens, to Gass's own translations that you have in the next quote. Uh, uh, Matthias, would you mind reading? The German? Uh, yeah. So this is Holderlin now, not wrong. With gelben birnen hanged and full with wilden rosen das Land in den See, ihr holden Schwäne und trunken von Küssen tunkt ihr das Haupt ins heilig nüchterne Wasser. With yellow pears, the land and full of wild roses hangs down into the lake. You great shaped swans, drunk from kisses, you dip your heads into the holy, sullen water. As this example shows, Gass's conceptualization of translation could be read as a more or less straightforward movement from one original text, the one that uh, Matthias uh, generously read, to his translated version in a different language. However, Gass's notion of transreading explicitly goes beyond this first interpretation, or for that matter, beyond any more or less straightforward attempt to conceptualize it. Within this framework, that is, within the framework of Gass's transreading, it is very important to emphasize its extreme particularity. That is, that trans-reading denotes for gas a specific form of reading, and ultimately, that it establishes a particular form of tradition of a very specific kind of literary text, what gas calls fine literature. Connecting gas, Rilke, Holderlin, in relation to each other in this case, and articulating a tradition in the very process. All this is just to clarify that gas is a theory of literary translation, that it is his theory of literary translation, and that therefore does not constitute a theory of translation in a more general or applied sense. So in order to focus now on the first point that I've just made, 
Let's go back to the first sentence of the sentence again. In that translation, one language and one particular use of that language reads another. Apart from constituting a movement from one language to another, translation here also entails an act of connecting different users of language, whether these are users of various languages or of the same language. German, for example. From this perspective, the act of reading is also an act of translation for guests in that it mediates two different users, uses and users of language. The actual process of reading, in a sense, connects, on the one hand, a particular use of language, for example, by user of German A, which in using as essay can be Holderlin, with, on the other hand, the process of experiencing and interpreting that use of language by another user, in this case, uh, user of German B, Gas. As Gas argues, quote, if I'm reading Friedrich Horling in German, uh, sorry, if I'm reading Friedrich Horling's German in German, the language will be trying to understand itself. And you have a full quote of the passage here. Next. And I love the fact that we're all reading, transreading gas through these handouts there. <laughs> it's like we're embodying transreading right now, uh, all, all of us together. Um, quote, if I'm reading uh, Friedrich Holland's German in German, the language will be trying to understand itself. Out of the number of words the German offers, Hodling has chosen these, and I can let them ring in my head as if heard. And I want to emphasize the idea of ringing in your head as heard, because it's extremely essential to understand what the process is in, in Gass's view and mind. And this is how he hears it, with yellow pier, pears hangs, sorry, so with yellow pears hangs, and full with wild roses, the lamb and the lake. Easily said, less easily understood, because the order of the word is, well, wild as the roses are. Quote. There is therefore what, can, what we can call an internal dimension to transreading at work here. In this case, gas is reading German within German, but here, with the distance we have to add, provided by another language, in this case, Gass's own English. This internal form of transreading, or we can call it this internal dimension of transreading, can therefore act as a preliminary literal translation. We could say, as a first reading and interpretation of the original, that, as conceptualized by Gass himself, happens to lack as such the kind of form, literary and linguistic form, and understanding, essentially a combination of both, inherent in Gass's final translation that I've showed previously. And in the next uh, page, you have the original German versus this first literal translation with yellow pears, hangs, and full with wild roses, the land and the lake. And in the next one, you have the final translation. So the, 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 the first one will be an intermediary or like an internal or first literal translation. And the final translation that Gass provides is with yellow pears, the land, and full of wild roses hangs down into the lake. And I wanted you to see that transition from the original, the internal translation, and the final translation as conceptualized by, by Gass. The notion of form in this instance is extremely relevant in order to analyze the various implications of Gass's theory of translation, as well as his own poetics as a writer particularly as we move here from a more literal to a more finished form of translation. As Gass argues in this regard, quote, what must not be given up is quality, quality and tone. If the translation does, does not, sorry, is the translation, sorry, if the translation does not allow us the greatness of the original, it is surely a failure, and most of us fail that way, first and foremost, last and put up. Uh, uh, put, a, put a look. Gass's notion of quality, the kind of quality of form that must not be given up, is related to what can be referred to as prosody in the field of rhetoric, poetics, and linguistics. By prosody, I'm referring here to the relation between both definitions of the term as defined in the Oxford English, Dic in the Oxford English Dictionary, that is, prosody as the patterns of ry rhythm and sound used in poetry, 
and on the other hand, prosody as the patterns of stress and intonation in language. There's a nice connection here between language, the form of language, and the form of literature, and poetics and linguistics that I think are connected really nicely in the way Gass is thinking about form, about this notion of quality and tone in translation, in form, in writing. It is precisely the complexity of this relation between Gass's transreading and his notion of quality, quality and tone as related, as related to prosody, as I'm arguing here, that is essential for our understanding of Gass's conceptualization of both translation and literary form. As Gass describes in his essay, The Aesthetic Structure of the Sentence, quote, primarily a form consists of terms in a significant relation, a relation of communal belonging and it gives rise to a quality or condition, a meaning, an emotional effect that could not be realized otherwise. Transreading, therefore, entails for Gass a process in which language is trying to understand itself as it, ex as it, is, as it is experienced by different users. This constitutes a process that articulates a sense of an original's quality as manifested in its form form being here the patterns connected to this translational relation in the terms just emphasized by Gass. For Gass, however, trying to understand means a complex attempt to listen to and reflect on the words and patterns of the original and gradually turning them into one's own. Thus, transreading entails for Gass internally connecting the temporality of the linguistic experience with the temporality of other past experiences, real or imagined. And I think that combination of temporalities is essential and fascinating too in the way he's thinking about this process. Transreading therefore involves and demands the process of mentally and creatively linking the memory of sensory images with the memory of literary images in a complex translational process whose various components coalesce with a strong phenomenological impulse in the very act of reading. The overall effect and the relevance of this particular conceptualization of reading as translation and of translation as reading is that for Gass, it is able to, quote, send him back to experience, creating what Gass refers to as one real and real whole, quote, where, quote, object and reflection are joined. So the idea is that transreading can send you back to experience in order to create a new sense of wholeness, a new reality or unreality that are connected to each other in the very process of reading. Quote, and this is, uh, you have this quote too, I believe. And you and I then, adopting the poet's position, can have ourselves to see what we are now, as well as what we shall become, illusory. And I'll read it again. Uh, and you and I then, adopting the poet's position, can have ourselves to see what we are now, as well as what we shall become, illusory. illusory. So, as you can see there, the way Gas is thinking about this process, it entails a, a, a having of the self in relation to this process of translation, uh, as we deal with the form of the language of the original in our own terms, in our own minds, in our own space, in our own languages and the way we're using language. And I think use, the usage, dimension of translation, uh, of transreading is, is essential. What is particularly striking about Gass's conceptualization of transreading is that while it facilitates a realm where object and reflection are joined, mentally and phenomenologically, in the terms I have very briefly described here today, it also creates in this very process a sense of community. This is a community precisely established through the temporal experience of various linguistic uses and attempts to understand an original form through what is essentially an act of reading. As Gass mentioned previously, at the core of his conceptualization of form, there is a sense of, quote, a relation of communal belonging that can appear and be articulated at the interstices between languages and their users original works and their translations. 
And when I was reading this, I was thinking of a different model to, to offer as a counterpoint. And I was thinking of Pound's theory of translation. That's for Pound's theory of translation, which he really theorizes as a process in which he calls digging for treasure. So it's finding luminous details in literary works, getting those details and incorporating into your own project, into your own poetics, into your own modernist translational process. The process for gas is very different. There is a relation of communal belonging necessitates a very specific understanding of the original in its own original terms. And as you may know, Pound's theory of translation it, it, at times completely disregards how the original functions on its own terms, particularly when he's translating Chinese poetry because he doesn't speak Chinese. So, I th <laughs> so you can see the difference in the way uh, gas is really, and also the specificity of gas's communal thinking of translation, which is fascinating. So this relation of communal belonging. This is not an ideal or idealized community or relation for gas, however. On the contrary, if translation is able to trigger, trigger a having of ourselves in relation to each other, in relation to two different languages, and in relation to ourselves as, con as constituents of the very process of translation, it can only do so as a reading. What seems to ultimately constitute for gas an illusory incorporation of an other that at its best can only temporarily appease our own anxieties, our own uncertainties, and the extreme frailty of our own temporality. Quote, what we get when we're done is a reading, a reading enriched by the process of arriving at it, and therefore really only the farewells to a long conversation. This is one of the quotes from Gasses. A farewells to a long conversation. And here's one of the most crucial aspects of Gasses' theory of translation. Translation as the most important kind of reading, as the kind of humbling conversation that you can have with a loved one, knowing full well that it is not a conversation that can last, no matter how much we really want this conversation to last, and knowing full well that it, can only, that it will fail to really matter, after all, in the larger scheme of things, other than as our own reading, as our own translation. And those are tough conversations to be had. I would like to finish this essay with a longer quote by Gass from Rina Rilke that I feel highlights the absolutely essential dimensions, the dimensions of his notion of transreading as an intrinsic part of Bill Gass's own role as a reader and writer and of his deep commitment, if you will, to translation. In the acknowledgments to his reading Rilke, Gass says, and this is the final quote that you have, the poet himself is as close to me as any human being has ever been not because he has allowed himself, now as shade, at last to be loved, and not because I have been able to obey the stern command from his archaic torso of Apollo to change my life, nor because his person was always so admirable it had to be imitated, but because his work has taught me what real art ought to be, how it can matter to a life through its lifetime how commitment can course like blood through the body of your words until the writing stirs, rises, open its, opens its eyes, and finally, because his work allows me to measure what we call achievement, how tall his is, how small mine. Thank you so much for your time.